in the light of the time in which we live and how we should live for God. And I abbreviated the whole thing into what would be H-I-G-H-L-A-N-D, Highland, so we would not forget and it would just be fresh on our mind. We talked about H meaning the highlight of what and who the center of our life is, highlighting God, the Almighty, and talking about Revelation chapter 4, the worship to God, and recognizing that it's, we were made for this, for His pleasure, and that's the reason why we are here. We went to chapter 5 of Revelation talking about the adoration and worship and all the exaltation of our Lord and Savior, the Lamb that gave His life and by whose blood we are saved. Then we went into what would be either inspiration, that is the word, how much it should mean to us, and influence of the Holy Spirit. We began with the word G and talking about grace, and we are people of grace, saved by grace, and because of what God has done in loving us and for what Christ our Lord did uh, at the great work of atonement. And so we talked about how important it is. So we come to the recognition grace is all about God. So we define what is grace, but it's more important to know who is grace. And when we, uh, the passage I, cho- I read from Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and verse 7, simply is talking about the Lord passed before him, proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God Almighty, gracious, long-suffering. These are all his attributes, and it's about who he is, and everything that he is is because of that we're alive, is grace, is mercy. I know this word is a churchy word, can be something very loose and flippant, but we need to understand the seriousness of this word grace. And this is a very strong word, a very important word in the scriptures, one of the important words that you find, because on this is based a very important doctrine, saved by grace and grace alone. We talked about from Ephesians chapter 2 and verse uh, 8 and verse 9, was saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. So understanding that, we need to recognize what grace is. So grace is about God, is attributes, but with regard to mankind, because I will explain this, when it came to Lucifer and the angels that fell, there was no grace extended to them. But when Adam made in the likeness of God, when he fell, God reached out, mission operation, and we find redemption beginning all the way with the blood and going all the way to book of Revelation, going through and ultimately finalized in and realized in the actual the fulfillment of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the last two decades, grace has been a very important study, but doing this, a lot of tele-evangelists brought its in such a way, almost it would seem grace to the point that you can abuse, that you can sin as much as you want because God is going to cover us. Uh, and chapter 6 of Romans tell, how shall we sin? And he goes on to, to uh, address this issue. Very important for us to understand, great, grace is a great important word for those of us who come to God, repent of our sins, and again, in present life as well, when we recognize the power of the blood, that's what makes the people of the old and the new, people that are called because of the blood that actually was in the Lamb, and in the New Testament, the actual Lamb that came and realized all that we are today. Grace should not be abused. Grace is very important, and when we realize the importance of repentance from sin, we realize that is grace extended to us. It's very important. Worldly sorrow, Judas said, but godly sorrow, Peter did, and there's a big difference, grace extended to Peter, uh, to Peter. So when we think in terms of grace, God's uh, vertical, in fact, reaching out to us in grace and mercy is very important. Let me just begin by saying that while you look at the old and the new, big difference, and I just want to touch upon the old because a lot of people think that the New Testament is only one reveals about grace and it's totally absent in the Old Testament. Uh, Yes or no, but there's not so much in terms of the way we say kairos the word for Greek in grace, it's a very important word that you find in the New Testament. 
But while this encompasses a lot of words, in the, New Test, in the Old Testament it's different because you don't have that one word grace saying it is uh, grace that is afforded to us because of God's love. It is, uh, Hebrew is concrete, while, whereas Greek is abstract. So when you are describing something in the Old Testament, it has many words into that. So grace encompasses so many different words, and unlike one word, charis, in the New, in the New Testament, grace. And we can read that grace, grace. But when you go into the Old Testament, there's not a peculiarly one word, but word that is uh, many different words that talk about uh, steadfast love, God's faithfulness, God's foundation love, and grace and favor and all of that. Those are very important. Let me just say this. When you think in terms of New Testament, all that would be in Old Testament in terms of types and shadows and uh, foreknowings of all that would happen come to pass and fully realized through the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So I will talk about that today. So when we go into the uh, God willing next week, we want to talk about grace. A lot of things uh, has been mentioned about grace. Almost all the epistle of St. Paul is literally about grace. He's a champion or what we would call the apostle of grace, saved by grace, and he makes a big claim and big deal about it, and it's the foundation doctrine in uh, the church today. But when you go back to the Old Testament, it is many words, but two very important words is simply canon or can, and then you also find the word hes. Canon simply is favor, and hes is simply many different words talking about not simply favor, steadfast love, faithfulness, grace, and all this many words, love, all of this is there. But you get a picture of that in literally images and symbols and people that shows and fully expounded and expressed in the New Testament. I would just say this. While grace in the embryo form is found in the New Testament, again, practically in the lives of these great men of the Old Testament, they're not fully realized uh, the grace that it becomes evident after the Lord Jesus Christ uh, gave his life and the temple uh, screen was uh, torn and you find everything like a floodgate pouring out and grace and truth and mercy is poured out because the fullness of it is come when Jesus died his work of atonement. However, grace is at the embryo form and in the lives of everyone that have been used of God and I will talk about it in just a moment. The best picture I talked about grace is G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. I guess that would be a nice way to express that. Another word was grace is something that God gives us that we don't deserve, and God does not give us that we rightly deserve. God does not give us what uh, does not give us what we don't deserve. In fact, uh, he could have punished us, but he didn't. He gave us grace and all the privilege. And he's not given us what we rightly deserve, hell and damnation. No, grace is simply he gives us what we don't earn, what we don't deserve, and thank God for grace. When you look into the New Testament, I talked about the floodgates opening when Jesus Christ gave his blood. And even as the blood was pouring, and when he said, it is finished, really, the temple uh, screen was opened, and you're going to find grace being poured out. And that becomes uh, all the more uh, important when you read the writings, particularly the epistles, because epistles are the largest number of grace. And more so in the writings or the epistle of St. Paul. He has a personal experience, and we all can identify in this awesome teachings of grace. One thing we need to understand, that grace is so important because it becomes a benediction, a very important benediction. You do have, I'll talk about the benediction in the Old Testament, but the way the benediction of the church really closes is very powerful. You can read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the grace. We can say it's not only the grace of God, but specifically the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. So it is the love of God the Father. 
that pours out this grace because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did. That's why he came, the divine, uh, leaving behind the splendor and taking upon himself the form of a man and suffered as a man and redeemed us by his blood. Unlike the Old Testament, here is the actual lamp. And this is communicated by the Holy Spirit, Father's love and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace is communicated to our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whereby we are saved. So with that being said, I want you to understand how important is grace, because the entire book, 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, and when you look at the 27th book, the way the last book of the last chapter of the last verse closes, that's how it finishes. Again, a benediction. When you read Revelation chapter 22 and verse 21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Full stop. Period. No more after that. That's how the entire Bible comes to a halt. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So this grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is simply because of the love of Yahweh, our Father. And this is because we can understand not by theological knowledge that we studied. It's just communicated to us by the Holy Spirit. It becomes an experiential expression for us that we all can identify by grace we are saved. Not of works. None of us can boast. But it begins in a rather embryonic form in the Old Testament. So when you read the passage, uh, the word... Uh, uh, chanan or shan, one of the words that the nearest about would be grace and favor. You find it particularly in the name of a woman whose name is Hannah, grace, you remember? She had gone through a torturous, insulting life. Uh, people abused her, particularly uh, the other wife of her husband began to distress her and her accusation against her. And in the end, she cried out to God, and she could do nothing about it. She, uh, her, she, as much as they tried, she just didn't have a child. But now grace is poured out to her, and she, the name Hannah or Grace, becomes experiential, and she pours it out in her prayer. I like the way, particularly in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 8 talks about. Listen to what she says. She gives this analogy. She's talking about that God has raised the poor from the dust. And then he, she says, God has lifted up the beggar from simply calling up from the dungeon. And then he's set us among the princes. And not only that, to have us inherit the throne of glory, the pillars of the earth of the Lord's, that he has set the world upon them. Think about it. Someone who's a beggar, that is actually charis, grace. The uh, uh, translation from the Greek simply means a beggar asking for bread. And so charis is simply the grace that is the Old Testament, which is a name simply means, and it simply chanon or kenon or ken, simply someone who is poor out of the dustbin, and someone who's a beggar out of the dungeon suddenly is caused and set to sit among princes and then to inherit the throne of glory. Isn't that amazing that the whole world is set upon this very important principle of grace and grace and grace? Grace is the completion. The last time I closed with Zechariah chapter 4, and the final call, the building is finished, and simply grace, grace, grace. That's how the book of Zechariah closes this uh, marvelous piece where the building could not be completed because of the mountain. And grace, 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 grace has done it. When nothing else that you could do, you have experienced, I have experienced, when we turned all around, there were walls, there were mountains, and then we cried out to God, and grace, profuse grace was poured out, and voila, it's done, and we say, oh my God, it is God, and God, and God alone. Give the Lord a clap offering. So when we look at these passages, I want you to understand a very important thing. Before I even go to what would be the epistle of uh, 
uh, in the New Testament, and particularly the life of Paul, the apostle of grace, we can learn and glean so much of truth from. Let us just go into what many would think grace is not there in the Old Testament. It's absent. No, it is very much present, but actually it forms character in the prefiguration and instances and into the symbols that you find almost in every page of the Bible, including what would be uh, people that have experienced this in a marvelous way. And i like you to understand that many words uh, cover this, what you could call God's faithfulness, God's love, God's mercy, exactly what you read about is attributes in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6. I want you to realize something very important. When you go into the Old Testament, why do we go? Especially, many people say, uh, we live in the New Testament time. The old is not where we build the doctrine on. The old is not something that we should fashion. The old is done away. It's completed in the New Testament. The, old ex the New Testament explains the old. So the old is very important to connect particularly in the lives of people that we can find so much and say, okay, this is the reason, and then you can find the entry into the New Testament. But if you were to read Romans chapter uh, 10 and uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, I believe, it's a, a wonderful word. So listen to what it says. Paul is saying, for whatsoever were written in the past, that is the Old Testament, whatever was written in the past, were written for our learning. This is for admonition. This is where we could learn from. And they're not simply stories. They're real life incident that the Holy, it, uh, so please the Holy Spirit to put them in the Old Testament so it is good for our learning. They become examples. And then goes on to say that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope patience and comfort of the scriptures. So we go gleaming in the scriptures to find hope. And this is patience and comfort we find in the scriptures. So a couple of things we're going to run through as fast as we can, just to give us what it implies and what it means. So when we begin this, let's just begin with a couple of very important things. So when you think in terms of Adam and Eve, grace was poured. Unlike Lucifer, when, they, when Lucifer and the fallen angels fell, there was no grace extended to them. But it was when Adam, Operation Rescue, Mission Rescue begins all the way in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and the seed of the woman becomes the reason why we are saved. It's all about not what about him who gives us grace and that covered it on the cross of Calvary. But what you find is when they fell, it's not so much talked about, but it's implied that there was a covering of grace when they lost their covering of uh, glory. They could not stand before God, neither could they stand before one another. It's shamefulness. It's filled with the uh, horribleness they felt, and God covered them. So when you read Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, it's simply, it was the coat that God gave, and his wife, the Lord, made coats of skin and clothed them. In plant, of course, an animal was sacrificed to be able to cover them. The blood shed the covering of what would be the goat skin, and that is what we call the grace of God covering us because of what Jesus Christ did at the cross. You look at every passages, almost every person that God used in the Old Testament, you're going to find studies and gems and nuggets of grace poured out and in the lives of these people. Again, a study of grace, practically. Look at Abel and Cain. God told them to bring an offering. Cain brought fruit, but it was the flocks that Abel brought, which was pleasing to God. There was reason for that. That is the blood, the point on which the grace is manifested in the old as well as in the new. And so it's simply God accepted Abel's sacrifice. That's a choice that God made. He knows why. And we understand the blood is involved, but it did not please Cain, so he murdered Abel. But you find grace in Abel, and grace poured out. And when you go into another place, actually the word grace is mentioned, not just implied, because when you turn to the life of Noah, sin, perversion, in such abyss, the earth had fallen, 
Uh, it was horrible. It almost describes the age in which we live. But there in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God looked high and low for someone. A reason why he could not, because sin had gone over, and this is something that you find God is loving, God is gracious, God is merciful, but there comes a time we need to understand God gets angry. Oh, don't talk about God. It is a fact. There is love, there is jealousy, there is wrath. But the fact is, it tides over, and when you go overboard, God says, enough is enough. But he looked around and he found one man. Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. That is important. And what you see outlaid is salvation in the person of Jesus on which the family is saved. Covered by the water, they that come to me in no wise I will throw out. And so you find no matter how the storm and other flood for 40 days, the earth was covered with water, but Noah and his family were kept safe. Grace, grace, Hallelujah. grace, grace of God. When you think about Abraham, listen, there's nothing good about it. I know people, the Hebrews will say, oh, God owes so much to us because of Abraham. Really? He comes from a wicked city of Mesopotamia, wickedness, abomination, and he's one among them. Not that he basically is a God lover. It's simply grace that chose. God chose Abraham in grace. Nothing what he did. It's what God did. And you're going to find in chapter 12 and verse 3, I'm going to bless just like that based on what? Grace of God. He was not a true worshiper of God, of the true God, but he was an idol worshiper. But God called him, it is grace, grace, grace. Don't listen to the yarn that God owes us a favor because of Abraham. God owes no one any favor, not at all Abraham. God chose him, grace. And you find how he made this covenant by a blood covenant. So in chapter 15 of the book of Genesis, Abraham was to cut animal. And it is not Abraham that walked through the made the covenant. Abraham did not. But God walked through saying, the Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate. And he walked through the blood sacrifice. That's exactly how God walks through because of the blood of Jesus and covers that with G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. So when you look at grace, it's a marvelous piece. In chapter 22 and verse 8, you find he's asked to sacrifice, and yet there was someone else that was provided. Grace provided something that is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ being sacrificed. And in verse 14, the name is Jehovah Jada, God provides. That is literally the Lamb of God that God provided the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, grace is manifested there. When you look at another man by the name of Lot, there's nothing that he should have grace. Uh, in fact, he split from Abraham, and he wanted the best land. So all the land that he felt was good. Of course, his uncle said, what do you do? Don't go so far into Sodom. That's where he landed up, in, and he was in Sodom. Now comes the time Sodom is going to be destroyed. Look at the grace of God. He allowed Abraham to intercede from 50 to 10, and he couldn't find 10 people. So he could have destroyed the whole Sodom, but he did not. He reached out to the one that Abraham literally was pleading for, and when you turn to this passage in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 10, literally the angel of the Lord had to pull this lot into and finally said, leave the city and don't look back. This is finished. That's it. Grace, grace, and grace alone. I like the way grace is poured out and manifested in the life of a man. They tried everything to put him down. His brother sold him. Then he was taken in by the Midianites, uh, made a slave, and then sold to Mr. and Mrs. Potipa. Mrs. Potipa didn't get away, so he's gone into the prison. Load down, cut down, whatever you could do. But I want you to understand, 
Genesis chapter 39 and verse 4. Look what it says. But Joseph found grace. Found grace in the sight of the Lord, and he served him and made him. So it is God's grace being poured out to the man in charge. What an amazing testimony. And so you do find this word played out in the life of Joseph. Grace in an Old Testament. What you and I can understand is Moses. Of course, law came through Moses, but grace and truth came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Something about Moses that stands out is his heart to seek the glory of God. God doesn't show his glory right away. He does show, and he says, you can't see it, but you stand, and I'm from the innermost, I will show. Cover your eyes. But what you find is God revealing the manifestation of his glory in the name of mercy, compassion, and grace. So let's just see the pleading of Moses. If you were to turn to Genesis, I believe, uh, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 33, let's read from verse 12, Exodus 20. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest to me, bring the people, thou hast not let me with whom you will send, yet you have said, I know you by name, and God said to him, you have found grace in my sight. I want you to understand, there's nothing good about Moses. He was asked to handle, he said, no, I can't. I can't speak, I can't do this, I can't do that. Everything he was incapable, he could not, he was not enabled, he didn't have the power, until God just poured him out. And there in that place that was uh, back south of the desert, God went, met with them. Now he's working out his grace in this man. So in the next verse, in verse 13, you see him saying, in, And now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me thy way that I may know thee, that I might find grace. Look at the number of times, grace, grace, grace. And then verse 14 and he said, my presence, God said, my presence will go with you. So you want grace, it's my presence. Will go with you and I will give you rest. Then in verse 15, again, and he said, if your presence, both saying if your presence will not go, don't carry up. I'm not going one step further. No, God's grace, God's presence. Paul later on says, his grace is sufficient. No matter what I'm going through, but we'll come to that next Sunday, God willing. Verse 16, he says, For wherein it shall be known that I and thy people have found grace. How do I know? Is it not that thou goes with us, so shall we shall be separated, I and thy people, from all thy people that are upon the face of the earth? So uh, he's saying, I need that grace then. And verse 17, he's again saying, And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also, which you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight. Forget about you are not worthy. Forget of the fact that you can't do it. Forget of the fact that you shatter and you stammer. Just know my grace is sufficient. It is God's grace that pulled up one of the greatest work in the Old Testament. The bringing of the slaves out of Egypt. Grace of God manifested in a feeble man like Moses. And verse 18, he goes on to say, Lord, I beseech you, show me your glory. And verse 19, and God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and once you know my name, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Hallelujah. Now here is Moses waiting on that mountain. Now I want to hear the name of the Lord. And in chapter 34, you can read verse 6 and verse 7. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. What is he proclaiming? And that is the name of the Lord. It is simply the Lord, the Lord Almighty, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. All of this encompasses that one word in the New Testament, karas, which is 
grace, grace, grace. You know, when you look at the children of Israel, they were all messed up. I'm telling you, so messed up that even after they had witnessed the greatest, mightiest move of God by the power of God, they have seen that we have never seen marvelous works of acts of God permitting that great, powerful empire called Egypt, humiliating Pharaoh and his men, the greatest mighty men and soldiers of the then known world, to come before Moses trembling, afraid of his very footsteps now. When you look at that, what you're going to find, they would have said, my God, we want to work with Moses. We want to be the best and the greatest people, people who love God. On the contrary, while all this was going on and while they, Moses was up on the mountain, they were down frolicking, fornicating, idolatry, and they finally carved in a god that they made out of their own. And they said, Valla, this is what uh, Aaron said, here is your god. I want you to understand why didn't God do away with them? The mass orgies, all of the filth, they could not resist jumping and running after all false gods. That's it. One word, grace. Grace. You see, when God tells Moses, he said, bless the people of Israel. If only they caught what it meant, the name of the Lord, they would have understood the power of God's choice and election for these people that really shouldn't be. None of us should be boasting. It's not of works lest any man should boast. The moment you boast we have done, you're going to fall. Grace stands on its own because of the blood in the Old Testament and the fulfillment of the blood in the New Testament. That's it. But you would have said, God said, enough! On the contrary, look at the words of benediction that you find God is asking Moses to have his brother bless them. You find that in Numbers chapter 6 and verse 24 all the way to verse 27. The Lord bless you and keep you. Verse 25 is very interesting. The Lord make his face shine upon you based on what? Gracious unto you. Verse 26, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now in verse 27, that is his name. Uh, in verse 27, and you shall put their name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. The name of God. And when you look at the name of Jesus, it spells love, it spells grace, it spells mercy. He's a man of mercy, he's a compassion, but his name is Yeshua, Yahweh, the one that ascends. When you look at the realization of what this means, you can full, find it fully in the, in the New Testament. Until then, you are seeing so much of it played out in what would be foreshadows and types and symbols and people in the Old Testament, saved by grace, touched by grace, uh, uh, empowered by grace because of God's grace and mercy. What you find about this is again the story of Rechab. She's somebody outside the fold. In fact, uh, she was an enemy. Her people were enemies of the people of Israel. They wanted to spring an attack upon Israel because they learned that they're coming all the way from Egypt, cities after cities are falling. But in the meantime, two spies comes out, and where do they land of all places in the home of a prostitute? You think God is concerned about this? Grace. She had no right standing before her people and absolutely nothing to do with the Hebrew people. But grace, grace, grace. So much so, when you read Joshua chapter 6, and I believe verse 25, look what it says. And Joshua saved Rehab, the harlot alive, and her father said, look at that. That is pure grace, grace, grace manifested. 
This is so powerful. The Amalekites are in control. People are scared. But you can't find most person who's so scared, so frightened, such a coward. A man by the name of Gideon actually hiding in the bush to get some meal prepared just in case he be caught. He's so scared. He's like, a, like the jungle rat. Nibbling here a little, doing a little bit here, just looking around. And suddenly the angel of the Lord said, Hail thou, mighty man of well. He looked around to see who's he talking about. <laughs> that is grace. Grace takes you to the, at the point where you are nothing and lifts you at a point where God <laughs> wants you to be. And so here is uh, Gideon literally wondering what in the world is going on. And so... He's saying something, I believe it's in chapter 6 of the book of Judges, and maybe verse 17 or verse 19. Let's look at verse 17. He says, and he said, if now I found grace in your sight, show me us. And if I found grace, come on. God is speaking to you. Isn't that capital G-R-A-C-E? But God is ever so gracious and let him decide which way do you want to show the sign. I will show it to you because I have some fun, something for you. You see, my friend made it tough. He brought in 32 soldiers, fighting men, and God says, dismiss them. Dismiss them until he came down to 300. How am I going to fight with 300? G-R-A-C-E. You can't boast. It was you, your ingenuity, your power, or a people's power. I brought it down to so low that you could defeat an army that you cannot number. That is spelled grace. God in the hem who is gracious. And every time you see what would the pre-incarnate Christ coming in all of these actions as the angel of the Lord, as one that is a king and a prophet, Melchizedek, all of this are a picture of grace. Jesus Christ coming in and encouraging and strengthening the people in the Old Testament. What you could find so powerful is a man that is widely used. Man that is the most popular, the king that even today people look back and say, we like it to be like the kingdom. That was never like this. The golden age that is the kingdom of David. Can I just tell you? If you call... Gideon a rat, I hate to say this, David was worse than a brat. He killed a man because he wanted his wife. Then he took this wife, she didn't look at him, but he brought his servant and said, bring her to me. And what you call it, today he would be in all the newspaper. There would be literally at lawyers making big money over this king. They will find 200 say, back to, uh, but, uh, you know, a uh, woman saying, yes, but Shiba is several of them here. No, it's one woman. And yet I want you to understand, there is something that God did that you cannot even imagine. Poured out his grace upon this man. In fact, when you turn to Psalm chapter 51, verse 1, this is the heart. This is the reason of a man that seeks after God. Lord, have mercy upon me according to your grace. That's the word loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, grace. Blot out my transgressions. Hold it. David began to lower down himself and say, I'm horrible. But he had a high view of God is loving kindness, is grace, and is mercy. In other words, he has a high regard for God, and it's not about what grace is, it's about who grace is. His heart for God was so strong, and I will just in a moment tell you that he preferred this man than a better man named Saul. Excuse me, yeah, a better man than Saul. Why? I'll tell you the difference. You know, when you look at this, you find a man that experienced grace like no one else. And out of this man's bosom flows grace. I mean, everything about David 
in spite of what he was, it's about who God is and who he is to him. His decision, his love, his plan, his yearning, his desire is all about God. Read his private diary called the Psalms. It's all about God. And then he says, how can I sit in a big palace? God gave it to him. Uh, I must build God a better place. He cannot dwell in tents. His heart is about God, God of grace, God of mercy, God of compassion. And in the New Testament, his name is Jesus. A man of mercy, a man of love, a man of grace. Law was given by Moses, but truth and grace came through Jesus. So when you look at this man, he expresses this in all of his psalm. His heart is pouring out with love for what God has done, and he's ever grateful for the grace of God. In fact, when you read Psalm 136, the way in which he expresses this thing, he says, His mercy endureth forever. Psalm 136, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, an expression of God's attributes. His mercy endured forever. He keeps repeating this all the way to the end of the psalm and the next psalm. His mercy endured forever. In other words, he's got in his head. He's hashed. He's hashed. I am hashed. In other words, I am graced. I'm graced. I'm graced by God. Look at me, a sinner. I don't deny what I did, but look at the grace of God poured out on me. And out of the bowels of that grace poured out to him, he's showing grace. You see, he was opposed to the nail, not just by the enemies around, the uncircumcised, but even by his own leader, Saul. Now the battle is over. Alas, Saul has died, and his son, Jonathan, who is a covenantial friend of David. David has reached the top, and now he's come to the place. His question is, how can I show grace? The amount of grace God showed me, how can I show grace? So right now, he's looking out, and he's reaching for someone that he could show grace to. So when you read 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 1, listen to what it says. And David said, Is there any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? He made inquiries. I want to show grace. Saul is the one that diminished you. Saul is the one, the reason why you are living and you had to live in the, in the jungles and in the caves. And then your parents and your, all the others had to join you because he hunted them down. I want to show grace, particularly for Jonathan's. Is there anyone that I could show grace? Verse 2, he comes across when he does all of the advertisement in the city, in verse 2, it says, there's a man named uh, uh, Saul's servant whose name is Ziba. And Ziba, the, the, he said unto him, Ziba, do you know anybody in the, Jonathan's family? Now look at the expression he says in verse 3. Is there someone that I should show grace? Verse 3. And the king said, is there not just any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God? Not kindness, but kindness of God, mercy of God, grace of God. Is there anyone of that house that I can show the kindness of God, the grace of God? And Ziba said unto the king, yes, there is a son who is laid. Actually, he is half. He's decimated. He's a nobody. He lives in a place that nobody wants. Losaba, he's basically shunted among the third grade. It's the decent priced place. When you read verse 4, verse 6, but let's go down to verse 7. 
In this verse 7, David said, fear not to Mephibosheth. I will surely show grace, love, mercy, kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore all the land your father has lost. You will eat bread in my table. And he restored everything that he had lost and more. And added more servants. And all that being said, he said, Ziba, you take care of the house. You take care of his farm. You take care of his vineyard. But as for Methuselah, he eats where I eat. He will be close in proximity to where I be and my children. I tell you, grace finds us in a point where we have lost. Grace takes us to the point where Christ searches for us and say, can I show grace? And brings us to the point and brings us to the king's table where his banner over us is love. That is grace for you. You know, when you look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah enumerates the horribleness of what his people have done. Talking about Disobedience, talking about disloyalty, talking about sin, talking about perversity, talking about everything, backstabbing God and disobeying God's word. But by the time you come to Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 17, he's putting in something amazing. He's saying, but for God's grace, but for God's mercy, but for God's love, and they refuse today, neither were mindful, their wonders that thou hast done, but hardened their necks, and their rebellion appointed captains to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and of great mercy and kindness, and forsook them not, and forsook them not. It is but the grace of God, but the grace. And that's what Ephesians chapter 2 says. But God commanded. And that's what Romans chapter 5 is. While we were yet in sin, God commanded his grace to us. While we were yet sinners. You see, this is so amazing, particularly when you see the book of Jonah. Grace outplayed not just for the people of Israel, for bin Laden today, and for all of the bin Ladens of tomorrow. In fact, there was no more violent, angry, filthy, murderous, killing spree people like the Ninevites. They were the worst enemy of Israel. But God sends his prophet. He is the prophet that goes reluctantly. And I'll tell you why he was reluctant about it. So when he is giving those, he runs off to Tashis, God has to deal with him. He's back in, in Nineveh, and God says, 40 days are determined. And you know how it's like hellfire. You're going to hell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to go to hell. Rather than, listen, repent. God is a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God of kindness. He's extended it to you guys. Take it, grab it. No, he went the next couple of days. Hell! Do you see preachers talk about hell more than heaven? Hell, you're going to hell! I tell you, preaching, no matter which style you use, if God's going to work, the Spirit of God will touch no matter what. And what's so amazing is from the king up all the way to the donkeys down, they were in sackcloth and ashes. That you've never seen in Israel. They were repenting. At this point, Jonah is on a high hill waiting for heavens to open. And like thunders of fire taking them, boom! It's called the best nuclear bomb. Thank God our army and our men are not doing that. God is in command. And he looks, nothing, not even a wind. Forget about a stone, a pebble, nothing. And God says, Jonah, what are you doing under the tree? And he teaches Jonah a lesson. So when you turn to Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2, Jonah is confessing, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it when you first sent me, I knew who you are. 
That's why I didn't want to go. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray you, O Lord, was not this my saying from the very beginning when you sent me? When I was yet in my country, you sent me to this no good people? Therefore, that's the reason I fled like God didn't know. That's the reason I fled unto Tarshish, for I knew you are a gracious God, a merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. I believe as much as God loves people of God in the New Testament, the Old Testament, God loves Hamas. And God loves every freaking people that want to kill us. His grace is extended to all people. It's not we who make the judgment call. God makes the judgment call. God's love is extended to all people. And I would tell you this. To understand grace, you've got to understand the life of this man called Manasseh. In fact, in second... Kings chapter 21, you hear this man Manasseh. He is the son of what would be one of the greatest revivalist reformer in the history of Israel after David. A man whose heart was so strong for God. Listen to what it says in 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 1. Gives you a little ickling of this man. He did that which was evil in the sight. Let's go to verse 1. Goes on to say, Manasseh was 12 years old and he was there for, for, for 51 years, 55 years. And then you can go to verse 2. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Next couple of verses, we don't have time. He made his children walk through the fire. He sacrificed his own children. He basically went into all of the abominations, brought in the uh, gods and demons and witchcraft into the house of God, put them right into the altar of God. Hey, my goodness, it's not that Persians or the others are doing, Syrians or, or even the Romans of the past, but it was their own people doing this. A man that was born into a home that was godly, and you wonder why people wearing crosses today are doing crazy stuff. Their parents may have been believers. Look at the mess that we are seeing today. It is bad company corrupts good manners. When you look at this man, Manasseh, you can't blame anybody. It is the, it, he was such a perverse man. In fact, you can read all of that passage. He killed more people than anybody else. In fact, Jerusalem was filled with the blood of people. Oh my God, how do you tolerate this man? When you look at his son, Anon, he did even worse than him. And then comes his grandson, Josiah, who brought in a great revival, but it was too late. God stayed the judgment because God loved his grandson. But he said, no, the judgment is past. It's coming your way. I'm sending an army that is the worst of the worst. The Assyrians, yes, from the Ninevites, all of that. And they're going to trouble you. But I'm just going to come here to this passage in Second Chronicles chapter 33. A little bit about this man. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like the abominations of the nations and the heathens whom God had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which his father Ezekiel had destroyed and broken down. He read the altars of Balaam and made groves and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of God. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Enom. And also he observed times and used enchantment and used witchcraft and dealt with feminine spirit and wizards. And he brought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he said, carved image, the idol which he made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house... 
and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to all I have said according to the whole law and statutes. Verse 9, look at the summary. So Benessah made Judah and the inhabitants of Israel to err and to do worse than the heathens whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake unto Manasseh and to his people, but they would not listen. Listen to what God did. This is grace. Grace running as fast as Manasseh is on his way to hell. Grace of God like the hound of heaven running after this no good cursed man. Wherefore the Lord brought upon him the captains of the host of the kings of Assyria and took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with feathers and carried him to Babylon. And until America goes through this, we will never know the grace of God. And, am I speaking to someone today? And when he was in affliction, for the first time, he looked up to heaven. For the first time, he took the name of God, not in vain, but in reality. The Bible says, when he was in much affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself, humbled himself, repented, that is what it says, and humbled himself greatly before the Lord his Father and prayed unto him and entreated of him. And God heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he is God. And the next couple of verses till he died, he was a changed man. What do you explain of this? It's spelled G-R-A-C-E. Grace. Grace in the New Testament, parables. But Jesus talked about this prodigal son running away and even more prodigal was the father in his love for a horrible son reaching out and reaching out in love running embracing him that is God who is merciful and who is gracious and who is kind I mentioned something very important when Lucifer fell grace was not extended Adam fell Operation Rescue, blood, all the way culminating in the New Testament when Jesus shed his blood, the work of atonement was done, salvation, grace comes into full effect. The floodgates of heaven opened and God poured out grace in so many varied ways. We're here today because of that. There is something I wanted to understand. Saul was a good king, comparatively. I mean, he's all American man, like Jacob. What you find is he's a strong man. He's a tall and hefty guy like every American would want their men to be. He would have been the best sportsman. And he was the leader. There's a man like Samuel praying for him, but his heart was not right. It was filled with hate and anger and ungratefulness. God reached out to him. He didn't care for him. Then when you read 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14, look what God said. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord had sought, looked out, searching for a man whose heart, what he did, he did. But his heart, when he broke down and cried before Nathan, it's I, it's I who did it, Nathan. And he goes out to God and cries out. After his own heart and the Lord had commanded him to be captain over his people because you have not kept which what God has given you. I have replaced you. No better man. On the contrary, no better than Saul. But God measures the heart. Grace is poured out because he is a man who repented like a child. And there's a mistake he made. 
And he cried out, and God said, that is Mount Moriah standing. That will be the temple of worship. Excuse me? God shows grace to a man who basically miscalculated his word, and he had grace because he cried out. He said, God, why are you letting others die? Kill me. Kill my family. But don't touch others. It's me, God. God reached out to the man and said, I'll show you grace. Grace is a beggar seeking for mercy. Not a man who says, yeah, repeat after me. Lord, I just come to you. I receive you, Lord Jesus. That is not repentance. It must come from your heart. Nobody can make you do that. You can walk down the aisles a hundred times. It must come where you are, in the church, outside the church, in your bedroom, on the street. You are gripped. God, have mercy. That comes from your heart. Grace is poured out. Law came through Moses. Law could not save. Law is a mirror that shows you you need the grace of God. You see, the Pharisees and Sadducees were a kind of people that tried to press the law. They are righteous. They said, you know, God owes us the Lord. We keep the law, really? No one has completed and perfected. Every one of us have come short of the glory of God. So they're poking God and saying, hey, look at your disciples. They don't wash the outside. They don't wash the hand. They don't do this. They're not talking about the heart, what God is looking for. They're looking at the washing of the plate and the washing of the hands and all the externals. But the Lord Jesus Christ said something very interesting in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13. He says, but go and learn what it meaneth. I will have mercy not sacrifice. You tell me you tight. You tell me you go to the temple. You tell me you fast. But where is your heart? Are you trying to impress others? Or are your heart just impressing you? You see, my friend, law will make you do things at a gunpoint. But grace wants you to give from your heart. Grace wants you. I mean, we're not here. Come on, come on. Clap your hand, clap your hand. No, it is just. You don't have to. But you just want to because grace is, you know, I don't want to give because the law, we are not under the law. That's the reason you should give more because you're under grace. That's the reason you should love God more because you're under grace. God looks for mercy, not sacrifice, trying to boast and say, I give so much, ring the bell, pay in something, and bribe him. That's not God. When you look at this in John chapter 1, verse 14, listen to what it says here. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. What did Paul, Moses say? He wants to see his glory. Of the only begotten of the Father, that is Jesus Christ, the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, full of grace and truth. John 1, 16. Again, John the Beloved expounds this and says, and of his fullness, of all we received, grace upon grace, grace for grace. And verse 17, listen carefully, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth, the total complete truth, Old Testament is complete in Jesus, grace and truth. Before I close, I want to ask you today, I have given examples from the Old Testament gems, nuggets of grace in the lives of ordinary people. But there is so much grace being poured out. I don't think anybody here would be like a minister. I hope you wouldn't. I hope you're not in all of this witchcraft and all these crazy stuff. But if you are, and I'm talking to someone today, turn around. You could still find grace if you would repent and go to God. Maybe you are Fettered in financially, relationship-wide, or in situation with your business, and everything you are saying, oh, someone has blackballed me, someone has put magic on me. It is God pulling you to him. Grace says, come on, just repent and turn around, and you can find the same grace as even Manasseh found. The grace of Jesus Christ flows to you.
the love of God the Father be manifested in you. And I pray the Holy Spirit will communicate this of all that Jesus did, blood that was put on the cross for you and for me.